Thank you. Um, it's a delight there to get the Prime Minister giving us a, a clear message. He is uh, at the G8, as you know, in Italy at the moment, so couldn't be here himself, which for me is a, a great blessing, which means I can be here. So uh, it's, it's kind of double-edged, that. What I wanted to do today was to, three things really, to talk about uh, the learning that I did during my career and to give some indications of the kinds of things that I think may help all of you in terms of how do we make the most of our civil service careers. Secondly, going on to the, the challenges that we all face as a society, hence for the government and hence for us as civil servants delivering the program of the government. And thirdly, what does that mean for us as civil servants in terms of our skills and the kinds of challenges we'll, we'll need and what we need to concentrate on in the next few years? So if I could start with uh, the personal bit, you know, what brought me into the civil service? I started life uh, uh, going to a state school, then on to Warwick University and then to Oxford. The reason I went to Oxford is because... Um, you might think it's kind of, I, I was reading economics, you might think it's because it was very good at economics, which it was, but I basically, my first choice career was to be a professional footballer, but I had everything it takes apart from talent, so <laughs> this turned out to be quite a drawback, and uh, I did discover though that in those days, uh, since my ambition was to play at Wembley, Oxford played against Cambridge at Wembley Stadium, so... If I made it to Oxford as a post-grad, I reckon I could make the team and play at Wembley. So ambition number one, get to Wembley. And uh, tick, managed to get to Wembley twice, actually, because it was a two-year post-grad degree. And um, so basically, life as an economist. And I think one of the lessons for me out of that is if you've got a real ambition, go for it. Sometimes you have to find indirect routes to it that mean you manage to achieve your ambitions even though you haven't got the best talent in that area. Uh, certainly sometimes your childhood ambitions are easier to meet than others. Glad to see somewhere in this audience uh, my daughter's come in listening and I remember her ambition when she grew up was to be a mermaid. Tricky. <laughs> um, she's moved on. Uh, so, the, uh, so that was economics and in those days when you went to Oxford as a postgrad, there was really only one acceptable thing to do. Uh, if you were good enough, you became an academic. If you were uh, not so good, you went off uh, to the civil service. And if you were not so good, you went off to industry. That was the kind of pecking order when I was a post-grad. This is in the years, dare I say, 1973 to 75. And it's very interesting that there was that pecking order, that the, the uh, academics, you know, the people who were teaching me, drummed into me. That was the kind of thing you did. You know, university, academic, great. Civil service, that was not bad, but, but industry, that was definitely below the salt. You know, if you failed at everything, you did that. Bizarre um, set of um, values, I think. Anyway, so I went off to be an academic uh, because that was what you did. Uh, I taught at the University of Glasgow, uh, and I had a brilliant professor there, a guy called Tom Wilson. And after a few years, you get a letter, which is basically tenure, which means you have then got a job for life. Uh, and I went to see my professor with this to thank him and say, this is really good, uh, really delighted about this. You know, what do you think I'd spend my next few years researching? Because uh, I had you know, my vision of being the next John Maynard Keynes. And Tom Wilson gave me one of those career chats that actually changed my life. He sat me down and he said, Gus, you're, you're a good, you're a very good applied economist, but you are never going to make it as an academic economist. You are not John Maynard Keynes II. That Nobel Prize for economics, you're not anywhere close. Uh, again, talent. Everything, application, enthusiasm, but not that degree of brilliance. And actually, it was mathematical brilliance that was getting people... Uh, the real uh, whiz kid stuff in economics then. It's kind of slightly gone wrong, that sort of economics, actually. Uh, but that's another story which we could go into if you want. Uh, and he sat me down and he said, you should get out. Now, having gone for a career chat with someone about giving me a job for life, 
I hadn't really expected to be told, get out. Actually, it was the best advice I ever got. Uh, I would not have been the world's greatest academic economist. I'm really interested in real world problems, in actually public policy solutions to real world issues like inequality, like how do we manage uh, globally. I was, I was working a lot on developing countries. How do we sort out getting growth into countries in those days like China and India, which were actually failing to grow at all. So that was my kind of passion, was developing countries. Anyway, I decided, right, that's it. I would listen to my professor. And sometimes the best feedback you get from your bosses is actually saying, here are your talents, here are the things that you think you're really good at, and actually, let's give you a kind of reality check. And basically, pointing you in that direction where your real skills are and how you can make the most of your life. So that was, for me, incredibly important. So I applied for jobs in government to try and do that. And I applied for uh, jobs with uh, the civil service. And I applied to join what was then ODA, the development side, because I specialized in uh, development. My second area of specialism was a thing called econometrics. So anyone in the audience that is an econometrician? Yeah, that's the usual response. So um, if there was, we could have had a little private chat afterwards, you know. But um, uh, it's quite an unusual specialism, basically using mathematical models to forecast the economy and all that sort of thing. So the net result of that is having applied to join and work on development in government, I was rejected. Uh, to They said, no, we want you in the Treasury, so you can do some uh, economic modelling, forecasting of the UK economy, all those sorts of things. Now, again, what do you do? So I, I decided to, okay, I would go with this. I wanted to work in government, so I took what for me was definitely second best, didn't uh, get into the development department. I now realise it's the hardest department to get into in Whitehall. Of our, of our graduates, we have by far the highest proportion applying to um, DFID. Why do they apply to DFID? Actually, there's a great passion amongst our children to basically uh, reduce world poverty. You know? And that's a really good sign, to my mind. Here are people who really want to change the world. So it's very good. When I got into the Treasury, I discovered, lo and behold, actually, the Treasury was very uh, involved in sorting out things like what's our aid budget, uh, how much money are we going to give to DFID, uh, well, it wasn't DFID then, it was ODA. So in fact, I was able to work on development quite a bit. So I worked there in the Treasury on my economics. And here's the other lesson for me, quite narrow, totally in my comfort zone. And a job came up which was totally different, which was to go to Washington and be the first secretary, i.e. a diplomat, in our embassy in Washington, D.C., in the States. Fortunately, and I applied for this, and there were four people that applied, and I was ranked number four by the Treasury in terms of aptitude for this, which really annoyed me. And the reason I was ranked number four is because they said, well, you're very narrow. And I thought, well, the reason I'm narrow is because I want, you know, I need some wider experience. And the, the second reason I was stuck was that they didn't have many people, you've proved this, who are econometricians. So I had a rare skill. Now, when you put these two things together, this is going to keep you in a box, isn't it? Because there weren't going to be many more of these people, and I wasn't going to be able to prove I could do more than one thing if I carried on doing the same thing all the time. So I think I needed someone to uh, back me. And I was very fortunate. There was a guy called Tim Lancaster, who was then the employing person. He was over in Washington. And he then uh, was the treasury person. He went on to be a permanent secretary and actually then to be head of SOAS, School of uh, Oriental and African Studies. So Tim actually took a chance on me. And he said, no, no, I don't want the top three. I want that guy. And uh, I went out to Washington, got to drive in a car with diplomatic plates. This is, you know, <laughs> there are some real bonuses to being in the Foreign Office. Overseas allowances is the other one I remember fondly. Uh, but also, more seriously, it was seeing things from a different uh, dimension. So I was in a different government department. I was able to look back on the UK government and see the kinds of things, you know, people say the Treasury's arrogant. When you look in another department, you look back on it, you think, I see what they mean, uh, because the people who are in charge of the money quite often come across that way, and it made me think about 
how the Treasury should change the way it operated. It was also fascinating in that they used to send me around the country, so I was able to go to really tough places like San Diego, Wharton Econometrics Group, and they would want someone to talk to the audience about the British economy. And I'd say, yeah, I, I know the British economy. I grew up there. I've got my 20-minute spiel on the British economy. And they'd say, no, no, no. This is San Diego, California, right? You get two minutes on the British economy. And basically, after a minute, they're kind of bored. Uh, very insular country, America, right? Most of the population don't have passports. When you go there, it's fascinating to see just how irrelevant the UK is. And it was kind of, boy, does this open my mind. So it was a really good broadening experience. Having done that, I wanted to do something different. The Chancellor then was Nigel Lawson. And he came out to Washington. Uh, we talked about economics. He was very interested in economics. And he said, no, come and work for me when you come back. And he wanted me to be his principal private secretary. I didn't want to do this because um, the hours that Principal Private Secretary works are horrendous and I believe in work-life balance. So I, this is, a, again, about career management. I did a deal with the then uh, press secretary, a chap called John Gieve. You may have heard of John Gieve. went on to be uh, Permanent Secretary at the Home Office and Deputy Governor at the Bank of England. I did a deal with John that uh, I'd do the press secretary job and he could do the private office job because the private office job was very prestigious and and John was prepared to work longer hours. Me, I thought press office job would be completely straightforward. I'd be answering queries from the journalists about the finer points of uh, you know, our economic forecasts and all the rest of it. Didn't quite turn out that way. Um, I, and, and again, it was an example, which I think I would recommend to everybody, again, totally out of my comfort zone. What prior experience did I have working with media? You know, I read the newspapers, I watched the news, nothing really. Uh, so it was a bit of a gamble. It's a bit of a gamble by the, the institution, the Treasury, to take me on. But I was learning new things every day. And when you're a press secretary, boy, do you learn. You know, and, and another learning experience for me was the, was the feedback. When you do jobs, you quite often don't get much feedback. When you're a press secretary and you make a mess of it, the feedback is there on the business page the next day, when the Chancellor phones you up and says, Gus, did you really say that the economy wasn't on track for our forecast? I said, well, not quite, Chancellor. Uh, and you get that kind of thing. That's, to be honest, the best bosses in the world. You know, Tom Wilson telling me to get out. The newspaper's giving me that feedback. Honest, objective feedback that tells you what you're good at and what you're not. And if it's an independent body like the media, you get it. It's a bit scary. I wouldn't recommend what I've done. You know, a bit of pre-job training would have been quite nice. But anyway, it turned out totally fabulous, an enormous success. Within about two months, Nigel Lawson had resigned. <laughs> He'd fallen out with his Prime Minister, uh, Margaret Thatcher. And again, when you look back on it, I've been so lucky to have experiences of chancellors and, and prime ministers that don't quite get on. So... This was a learning point that turned out to be useful later. Um, <laughs> so, John Major takes over, uh, and I work with him quietly for a year as Chancellor. Nothing much happens, and then uh, Margaret Thatcher, uh, the whole Tory party conundrum. Margaret Thatcher goes, and John Major wins the leadership election and goes to number 10. Now, here's your big moment. What do you do? Do you stay in the Treasury as the Press Secretary and work for the new Chancellor, or do you accept the offer of the Prime Minister to go and be Chief Spokesman for the Prime Minister in number 10? Take over from Bernard Ingham, who had a certain reputation, big reputation, very visible character. You think, hmm, do I want to do this? Uh, at this point, I have a daughter who's three weeks old. Uh, again, I took the risk, and I... Um, you know, my family uh, were great about it. Um, so I did it. It is, a, there are times when you do these things, and when I look back, I wonder if it was the right thing. But it was a brilliant experience. Uh, there was about 18 months to go to an election, so I saw what it's like for a party to have a change of prime minister within the same party and then a run up to an election. You'll begin to see that this could be quite useful experience for the current time. Um, 
that, that was amazing. A lot of people said, don't do it. There's only, at most, 18 months to go to an election. And the Tories are, in fact, 20 points behind the opinion polls. They're bound to be beaten. So you'll be characterized as a Tory, and you'll be thrown out. And that'll be the end of your career. Goodbye. I took the risk. It was fascinating. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary of the day, Robin Butler, said, lower the profile of the post. Make yourself an objective, independent civil service doing the news. And the key for me in that was to get the lobby system working again. The lobby system was slightly teetering at that point. The Guardian and the Independent had decided it just wasn't appropriate, and they, they were boycotting the system. Uh, I managed to get them back into the lobby and to do it, so I was briefing everybody. Uh, so that, I thought, worked quite well. We went through that. Uh, in the end, he won an election against all the odds. Uh, and I stayed as press secretary for uh, till that was in 1992. I stayed till 1994. So I've done about four and a half years. It's the most addictive job in the world. You're working 24/7. You're on call. You travel around the world with prime ministers. It's very glamorous, but it's desperately hard, and you don't see much of your family. And my wife said, "Who the hell are you?" Uh, when I came through the door one day, virtually, and she said, "Look, this this is too addictive. You should get out." Very good advice. You'll get really good advice from people close to you. You need to understand that these sorts of jobs, you know, there should be a statute of limitations on that job. You shouldn't do it for too long. I think Alistair Campbell, for example, did it for too long. You just need to get out at the right moment. So I got out in 1994, which looking back on it was pretty good timing, quite happy about that. Uh, and then went off, I uh, actually went back to Washington and finally got to work on development, being on the boards of the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, and then uh, learned a lot about development, learned a lot about being on a board and, uh, again, working for a different institution uh, and being a director on a board. Great. Great experience. Got called call back uh, by Gordon Brown to work in the Treasury. Um, I'll speed up now because it's all quite modern. Uh, became permanent secretary at the Treasury, been asked by Tony Blair to be cabinet secretary and then saw through the the Tony Blair Gordon Brown episode and the transition and uh, have spent since 2005 as cabinet secretary and head of the civil service. As part of being head of the civil service, for me it was really important that I made up for those gaps in my career. You know, my career was by no means perfect. The best person to be cabinet secretary should have spent some time doing operational delivery. I didn't do it. Uh, I would have loved to have done more. So I've tried to make up for that by spending a lot of my time going around the country, visiting people, learning from the front line. And that's quite appropriate because we're publishing something today on learning from the front line. It's a, a response to a report done by the Sunningdale Institute. And they, they've done some tremendous work. Uh, and uh, basically, it, it's something that's picked up in the lion's lair and, and all the other things we've got, that actually lots of the best ideas come from our staff at the very front line. So that was my learning. Um, how has it prepared me for the challenges that we have in the civil service today? When I think about the challenges, and we think about the big challenges we face, things like climate change. Uh, if people were, were here at the reception last night, the head of the Met Office speaking quite eloquently about that. And I managed to visit the Met Office to see the people that actually do the long run projections of our climate and believe me if there are any if anyone in the room who's a skeptic about climate change go to the Met Office speak to the experts and they will tell you uh, to my mind totally overwhelmingly compelling evidence of climate change that is a big issue for us is it something that we can solve as civil servants and as governments well I think that it operates at so many different levels. As individuals, we can do things. You know, I can insist on people traveling around to the extent they have to travel around in cars. They travel around in cars that are very low CO2 emissions. I have as one of my objectives that I ask all of the permanent secretaries to deliver on is sustainability of the government estate. So you will have noticed, I hope, in all of your departments, some work on improving the greenness with which we operate, certainly our IT equipment. This is, uh, was news to me, but one of the big drivers of our CO2 emissions in government is the big increase in the number of computers we've got. If we can reduce the uh, energy 
footprint of those, the CO2 footprint of uh, our computers, we could actually uh, reduce our overall CO2 emissions quite dramatically. Quite interesting. So climate change, big issue. We have to manage that individually at a local, at a regional, and a national level. You know, the Prime Minister is currently today working on uh, his G8 counterparts and China, India, Russia, Brazil, South Africa, the, the big five, to get a deal uh, by the end of this year at Copenhagen where we'll get binding commitments. Really big things, but actually, you know, we need to operate at the individual level all the way through to the global level to solve something like that. That requires us to work across our boundaries. You take something like uh, obesity, massive problem for all of the richer countries in the world. Uh, if you look at the projections for what's going to happen on obesity, what that does to our health budgets, what that does to our fitness, it's dramatic. If you look at aging numbers, very clear we are aging. The, there's a letter in the FT today from someone about what happens in the States. It's really scary that half of the total health spending in the States per person is spent on them in the last 30 days of their lives. Right, so we, we spend an enormous amount just at the end. Uh, for us, uh, health spending is going to go up because we're an aging population. We're going to need more. There's going to be lots more uh, drugs developed, which will be quite expensive. There'll be lots of ways of managing that, which I want to talk about in a minute, but that's going to be a big driver. So there's going to be all of these big drivers. The thing that brings them all together is that they require us to work across boundaries. Uh, so this brings me to the... So, oh, and the final point, of course, got lots of big challenges. Probably the biggest challenge for us in the next five to ten years is that since we are now going through a recession and the things we're doing to try and get to mitigate the impact of that recession means that we are, the government is borrowing a lot of money and running up debt. The public expenditure situation is going to be very tight in the next five to ten years. We are going to be required to do more and more with less resources. Uh, people are going to expect ever better services. If you go around this uh, conference, you'll see uh, dramatic. Uh, if you go to the health stand, tremendous things that we can do for people. Uh, and their expectations will rise. You know, you expect brilliant services from your television, from your mobile phone now. You expect not just three channels, you expect hundreds. We expect our mobile phone to be able to transmit pictures. Uh, we want to use it for email as well. Uh, people are going to expect the same from public services. Going to, they're going to expect to be able to interact with us when they want to, not when our shop is open. So if you want your car tax, you want to be able to do it when you get home at night. You don't want to have to go down to the post office. You want to do it online or on the phone. You can. We have brilliant services. The public sector, at its best, does tremendous services. So we can match this challenge but it will be harder for us than the private sector. This is why I think maybe they got it right in Oxford when they said, you know, civil service above private sector. When you think about the private sector, they're not trying to do things as difficult as us. Think about Tesco's. They're prepared to sell to people, but actually it's only prepared to sell to people who can afford their products. If there's someone who's too poor, hey, tough. If there's an area where uh, basically it's not economic to have a, a, a shop, they wouldn't have one. The private sector is driven by the profit motive. Apart from Visa, not for profit. Just need to put that in. Um, uh, they are driven that way. We have to get our services out to everybody. And we also have to get it out to those people who maybe are digitally excluded. And the, the Stephen Carter's Digital Britain report went into the kinds of things we'll need to do, the billions of pounds we'll need to spend to try and open up services. Again, if you go to the health... Uh, uh, stand down here, they will show you ways of using new technology to help older people who've maybe got dementia or other problems be independent, live longer lives on their own, uh, quality lives, and I think that's hugely important. So finally, so those are the big challenges. What does that mean for the sorts of skills that we in the civil service will need in the next five to ten years? First of all, and that's the whole point of this conference, we need to innovate. We need to be different. We need to think about joining up across the departments. And this conference is unique in the sense of 
It's across all grades and all departments. If we don't succeed in joining up as a civil service, we won't be able to meet these sorts of challenges. If you think about how do you do an obesity strategy, well, you're trying to do, you know, the Change for Life program is a classic example. We're trying to change people's behavior. That needs us to work with schools, so we need DCSF. That needs us to work on the health side of it, so we need Department for Health. Uh, we actually need the Treasury to give us some money. You know, it, it expands across departmental boundaries. That's why I've suggested for the future uh, that some of these big issues might actually have their own budget rather than trying to kind of get bits of budgets from different departments. We actually have big issues with their own budgets. Um, in all of these things, trying to manage better services and value for money, one of the key things will be for us to prevent problems rather than solve them when they occur. So if we can stop people uh, getting into hospitals, that's what the health side is about. If we can stop people getting into the criminal justice system, uh, how can we do that? Well, by better education services. How do we ensure that we give people a really good start? Well, Sure Start, if anyone's seen Sure Start in operation, they'll see that's a brilliant operation, and it's preventative. Keeps people as productive members, taxpaying, rather than all of this. So. As, as a civil service, we'll need lots of different skills. We'll, be, we'll need to be able to work across boundaries, across boundaries of departments, but also with the public sector, the third sector, and the private sector. It's one of the reasons that I work with Peter Jones. The private sector can sometimes be very, very good at delivering efficiently, and we need to work with them. Ministers, I tell you, in the future in particular, as they're searching for value for money, will want to do things in the most efficient way. And that means that we as a civil service will have to battle to prove that we can deliver the best service for people. One of the weapons in our armory there will be that we understand the public. We're a diverse civil service. One of the things about the private sector is they are not very diverse in terms of who they employ, particularly at the top. If you look at the figures for, say, women on boards of FTSE 100 companies, less than 5%. Uh, they're, you know, they're going backwards rather than forwards. We are brilliant at diversity in the civil service, but we're by no means brilliant enough. We are improving things. I was, I was just looking back at the, the things downstairs to see where we've come from, and, and people have put some things on the memory board. Which, so if you think about the civil service today, we are we're getting better. We're a majority female civil service. We are the proportion of black and minority ethnic in the civil service is pretty much in line with the population as a whole. Not enough at the higher levels, so we've got a big issue there to raise people's aspirations to get them through. Uh, that's the big issue for us, so we need to push people through. On, on the gender side, again, we need to push people through the ranks. Current trends are encouraging. If you, if you just extrapolated current trends, people tell me I shouldn't do this, but by 2020, the whole of the senior civil service will be majority female as well. And that just hasn't happened by chance. It's because we're offering better job shares, more part-time working, uh, more work-life balance. It's not good enough. None of this is good enough yet, but it's a hell of a lot better than it was. When I look back, uh, this is a, something I, I love. You may have heard me mention this, but why weren't there many women before? Well, we used to have a ban on women in the civil service when they got married. Can you believe that? And we did a report in a very civil service way, and I've got this. It says, the removal of the marriage ban may encourage immorality. <laughs> but, it goes on to say, departments testify that the usefulness of the women concerned has in no way been impaired by marriage. <laughs> I just can't believe that. I mean, the things about the civil service as to where we were is worth remembering because actually we'll look back on things today and say, how did we do that? When there's a memory board downstairs and I picked out a few of them. And, and the one I put up there, my memory, was the first note I got from my boss was Dear O'Donnell. And I thought, O'Donnell, that's a bit rude, isn't it? I mean, why doesn't he use my first name? It always carried on like that. There were people who worked in the same office for years who called each other by their surnames. Something to do with the schools they went to, I think, but it didn't happen in Battersea. Um, another memory, someone who had to get permission to use the, telegrade, to the telephone if you weren't of a certain grade. Can you imagine that? Uh, 
crowding around a screen to see the first emails being sent, booking a time slot to use the internet, uh, and I love this, fruit cake and sherry on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> Some of these things we may need to go back to, you know. I quite like fruit cake, not sure about the sherry. So, uh, a lot of diversity uh, matters. The final thing I'd say is, in the next few years, what is it about civil servants that actually gives us a comparative advantage over any other provider of services to the public? And I think it is our values. People expect the civil service to be fair. They expect us to be our values of honesty, objectivity, integrity, and impartiality mean that they think, OK, if someone's going to collect my tax, I want it to be the government. I want it to be done by civil servants, because I trust them to keep it safe. I trust them not to pass on my personal information to others when they shouldn't. So that trust is really important. And that set of values for us, hugely important. That last one, impartiality, absolutely vital. In the, as we approach an election, coming up to an election within the next year, we must show that as a civil service, we are ready to work for whoever we as a public elect. Sometimes, back in my days when I started working for John Major as Prime Minister, there may be presumptions that one party is a long way ahead and that therefore everyone should prepare for a change. Of course, as a civil service, it's right for us to do the necessary contingency work. But actually, our job is to work for the elected government of the day. And whilst we need to be ready, prepared for whatever the electorate may do at that election, we have our duty of whoever is elected then to absolutely work for that government. So those values are very important. The final thing I'll say is I've always added to them my four Ps, that I think the thing I like about the civil service is actually making the world a better place, changing the world, reducing child poverty, the stuff we've done globally on development. We're way ahead of other countries, and, and the Prime Minister will be taking credit for that in the G8. Italy has just failed to meet its commitments uh, very badly in terms of the amount of money it pledged to give uh, to aid. And at this point, you know, the developing countries during this recession are being hit harder than anybody else. The numbers who are moving back into poverty as a result of the lack of world growth. That's what gets me going. That's what inspires me. And that's why I think my P's, my pride and passion in what we do as a civil service is really important. We can be objective, but we can be passionate. We can be passionate about reducing child poverty. We can be passionate about making the United Kingdom and globally the world a better place for us to bring up our children, saving the planet. These are not cross-party issues. These are things that we can all agree on. So let's have pride and passion in being a civil servant and let's attack all of our issues with pace and professionalism. Thank you very much.